Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the uh, 15th NERPS webinar series on peace and sustainability in the context of global change. And thank you so much for joining us today on this conversation with Professor Akiko Yuge about the United Nations 75th Anniversary Declaration, Our Common Agenda, and the Sustainable Development Goals. My name is Dalia Simangan, Associate Professor at Hiroshima University, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. Now I'd like to ask our NERPS Director, Professor Shinji Kadeko, for his welcome remarks. Thank you very much, Daria. Um, good afternoon or good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining today. If it is your first time joining us, NAPS is based at Hiroshima University and serves as a global network and, in, and information hub for SDG promotion and the participation of all stakeholders in peace and sustainability. In 2020, we started this webinar series with the inaugural talk by Je Professor Jeffrey Sachs to serve as a platform for dialogue with leading experts on topics related to environmental, social, political, economic, and technological aspects of global changes. That's why today we are very honored to have with us Professor Akiko Yuge of Hosei University who has a very rich experiences in international organizations. This issue we all face right now are becoming more challenging and complex, especially in the context of conflicts, ecological threats, and currently the COVID-19 pandemic. And I look forward to Professor Yuge's insight on how to address these of uh, the, some of these challenges based on her observations of the last year's United Nations 75th anniversary declarations, our common agenda, and the SDGs. Her experience and expertise will help us better understand the opportunities and challenges to the achievement of the SDGs in the midway of the, the goal 2030. So I hope that uh, you will join us as we continue these conversations at our first Hiroshima International Conference on Peace and Sustainability from March 1st and 3rd, 2022. Daria will share some of the details of this conference later. Welcome again. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much, Professor Kaneko. And now it's my honor to introduce to you our special guest today, Professor Akiko Yuge is a professor at the Department of Global Politics, Faculty of Law at Hosei University. And prior to that, she served as the director of the UNDP Representation Office in Tokyo as special advisor to the UNDP administrator. She held several positions in UNDP field offices, such as in Bhutan, Indonesia, and Thailand. Professor Yuge holds a Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University and a Master of Arts in Development Economics from New York University. Thank you for your time, Professor Yuge, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. So first of all, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kaneko, for that very warm uh, welcoming remarks. And thank you very much, uh, Dalia, for the very kind introduction. Um, and of course, good afternoon to everybody and good morning and good evening, depending on where you are. So uh, I'm very glad to be here and I'd like to thank NERPS of Hiroshima University for inviting me to be a speaker today. Thank you very much. Uh, I will start my presentation and the title is United Nations 75th Anniversary Declaration, Our Common Agenda and SDGs. The outline is on that slide. Um, so I will first talk about the uh, UN 75th anniversary activities, I mainly talk about two major achievements, and then talk about what followed after that, which is the UN Secretary General's report titled Our Common Agenda. And then I will share my observations and comments in moving forward. And the last one is what's next. Okay, so the first one is on the 75th anniversary. As I said, um, the 
there, there were many, actually there were many uh, activities. There was a whole series of activities for the whole year of 2020. Uh, what I would like to talk about is first, the UN 75 initiative, which was a global consultation that the UN Secretary General launched at the beginning of that year. And it was a year long consultation um, involving all the 193 member states and more than 1.5 million people participated and they share their views about the future as well as priorities for international cooperation and for the UN in particular. So what was the outcome of that? Uh, of course, there were some differences depending on the country, the region, and the human development levels. But overall, these are the results that were shown. The immediate priority, uh, the top one was universal access to healthcare. Of course, you can understand it was in the middle of COVID. Then other short-term high priorities were investment in education and youth programs, access to safe water and sanitation. When it comes to longer term priorities, the top one was more environmental protection and other priorities included employment opportunities, more respect, respect for human rights and reducing conflict. To address these global challenges, 97% of respondents believe that international cooperation is important. And they also look to the UN to lead in international cooperation to address these challenges. Many uh, respondents also wanted the UN to innovate, to be more inclusive, more engaged, more accountable and effective. So then looking at the second uh, major achievement, which uh, was the declaration uh, of the, on the commemoration of the UN uh, at the 75th anniversary, which was adopted at the UN General Assembly in September 2020. And I, I make some quotes from this report. It said that our challenges are interconnected and can only be addressed through reinvigorated multilateralism. And multilateralism is not an option, but a necessity. I will talk about the multilateralism uh, in a bit more detail later on. Another quote. There is no other global organization with the legitimacy, convening power, and normative impact of the United Nations. And of course, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is our roadmap and its implementation a necessity for our survival. You will see a lot of linkage between our common agenda report and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The declaration itself also, uh, besides having the vision, had 12 specific commitments. And I listed these commitments there. Uh, I will not read out each one of them, but you can see the list there. And if you go through the list, you will note that most commitments cover the areas contained in the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. What I did is I underlined four commitments out of the 12, uh, and you can see that they are number six, we will build trust. Number seven, we will improve digital cooperation. Number 11, we will listen to and work with youth. And number 12, we will be prepared as the commitments that I felt that give more emphasis, added emphasis, compared to the 2030 Agenda and SDGs. I mean, we will be prepared. I think that refers to the fact that the world was not prepared with COVID-19 and that we need to make more effort to be prepared more to, for any future pandemics or other uh, events. But you can see these four and they will come out in our common agenda report by the Secretary General, okay? So what happened after the declaration? So declaration was adopted by the UN and the member states requested the UN Secretary General to report back with recommendations to advance our common agenda and to respond to current and future challenges. So that was the next step after the declaration. And take it, taken, taking this request, the Secretary General carried out extensive consultations with not only member states, but also thought leaders, 
young people, civil society, local governments, parliamentarians, the UN system agencies, and its many partners. And based on the very extensive consultations, the Secretary General came up with the report titled Our Common Agenda on 10th of September, 2021, last year. So this is what I'm going to talk about as the next item. Our Common Agenda, the report of the UN Secretary General, uh, he contrasted two possible scenarios. One is a world heading towards breakdown, um, perpetual crisis, and he said that or a breakthrough with more positive outlook based on solidarity and cooperation. So with this question to start with, he said humanity faces a stark and urgent choice, breakdown or breakthrough. And the report emphasizes the need for solidarity, trust and cooperation. The report further states, in this time of division, fracture and mistrust, the United Nations is needed more than ever. And that our common agenda is an agenda of action designed to accelerate the implementation of multilateral agreements and cooperation, particularly the 2030 agenda and SDG. So here again, a very strong and clear reference to the 2030 agenda and SDGs. Okay, this is the cover page of this report, our common agenda and it contains 90 specific recommendations, nine zero. <clears throat> and these recommendations are grouped under four broad areas. And the recommendations under each broad area are interlinked with those under other broad areas. So it's not as though, you know, the four are separate. They are very much interlinked, They're just like the SDGs are very much interlinked. So I will go through each broad area. Um, <clears throat> please note that there's no time to go over the 90 recommendations. So what I did is under broad area, each broad area, I listed in one slide, uh, some of the key recommendations, but of course um, there are more. So, so please bear in mind that, that this is not really like a summary, but just selecting some key ones. So the broad area number one <clears throat> uh, titled renewal of social contract anchored in human rights to rebuild trust and social cohesion. Um, and recommendations included under this broad area include these that I listed here, achieve universal social protection coverage, <clears throat> including universal healthcare, education, housing, decent work and income protection, and hold a world social summit in 2025. Please pay attention to other summits that the secretary general proposes, but this is one of them, 2025. Then also another recommendation is to eradicate violence against women and girls and ensure their full and equal participation. Another one is address tax evasion, money laundering, and illicit financial flows. A different one is correct the blind spots in how we measure progress and prosperity by including measures that complement GDP and ensure that profit do not come at the expense of people and planet. Well, as you know, uh, GDP fails to capture many of the uh, features of human well-being and sustainability of the planet and services and care that are not part of the economic market. So for instance, when there's overfishing, destroying the environment, or there is uh, too much cutting of the forest trees leading to timber industry, many of these things are counted as a plus increase in GDP because it leads to economic activities, but what it does to the planet is minus. But then, so, so we need a system that captures uh, both of these elements and not just the one-sided. The last one I listed there is tackle the infodemic of misinformation plaguing, plaguing the world and introduce a global code of conduct that promotes integrity in public information. As you know, there's so much misinformation about the COVID-19 and other things. So moving to broad area number two, titled Focus on the Future through a deepening of solidarity with the world's young people and future gen generations. The recommendations included are transform education, skills training, and lifelong learning, and convene a transforming education summit in 2022. So here's another summit. 
uh, because the traditional education systems uh, that are, are not necessarily reaching many young people and children. So there must be transforming transformation in terms of, for instance, including digital uh, literacy and other things. Another recommendation is promote long-term intergenerational thinking and equity and establish futures lab to conduct forecasting and future impact assessments of policy decisions. So we have to look more and think more about the effect of the decisions today. What does it mean for the future? And then it's not just one year or two years, but five years and 10 years from now. So we need to focus much more on that aspect. Another recommendation is to appoint a special envoy for future generations, establish a United Nations Youth Office, repurpose the UN Trusteeship uh, trustee Council into a future-oriented body, and also agree on a declaration on future generations. Moving to broad area three, uh, titled Urgent Action to protect and deliver our global commons, which means oceans, atmosphere, outer space, Antarctica, and global public goods. And recommendations included there include immediately establish a global vaccination plan for COVID-19, establish an emergency platform to be triggered in response to large scale crisis to better prepare for future global shocks. Also, there's a recommendation to prepare a new agenda for peace, uh, to agree on more effective collective security responses and a meaningful set of steps to manage emerging risks such as cyberspace and new technologies. Also, there's a recommendation to hold a biennial summit of heads of state and government between the members of G20 and members of ECOSOC, the UN Secretary General and the heads of the international financial institutions like World Bank, Asian Development Bank and so forth and to work towards a more sustainable, inclusive and resilient global economy. And the next one is another summit, convene a summit of the future in 2023 to forge a new global consensus on the most critical concerns that the international system must protect and deliver, including peace, climate action beyond 2030 and digital commons and outer space. Um, the last one I listed there is establish a high level advisory board led by former heads of state uh, or former heads of government to inform the summit of the future and advance governance in the areas of greatest concern. And the fourth area is an upgraded United Nations that's fit for a new era, so UN 2.0. And transformation is uh, needed driven by data, digital innovation, strategic foresight, performance and results orientation, and that there's a need to strengthen the UN as a source of reliable data and evidence, and to establish the Secretary General's scientific advisory body, also to create an advisory group on local and regional governments, and also strengthen collaboration with civil society organizations and the private sector. Of course, both are important. Um, I would add that inclusion and accountability of the private sector is essential, considering that the solutions are increasingly dependent on the private sector, including their technologies. So there are other recommendations on UN reform if you felt that this slide is a bit um, simple, uh, and uh, made, but many are included under other broad areas. As I said, uh, they are very much interlinked. So what I like to do is next talk about multilateralism because we need multilateralism and a good multilateralism. Here I listed inclusive multilateralism and a more networked multilateralism in order to uh, proceed and implement the recommendations included. In the next page, I have listed the two more items. So let me go one by one. So one is more inclusive multilateralism. So in addition to the more traditional uh, partners in multilateralism, which means member states and international organizations, the non-state actors, and there are many, including civil society organizations, academic and scientific institutions, foundations, the private sector, parliaments, cities and local governments, communities, regional bodies, and more, they must be part of multilateralism. 
because they have rich knowledge, they have expertise, they have experience and capacities because of their different um, roles and, and different forms and they are diverse actors and they must be drawn in more systematically to tackle the global issues that they are involved in and they need to be involved more. An example that I listed is the ACT Accelerator, Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, and that includes a whole list of different uh, diverse actors. Um, if you're interested, of course, you can check many of them. Many of you may be aware. And the other thing is the views of developing countries should be reflected more. Of course, they are member states, uh, but then I feel that uh, their voices should be heard more and reflected more. Then young people's voices, as you saw in one of the broad areas, uh, they must be heard and they should participate in decision making. Number two is more networked multilateralism. So going beyond the traditional silos, you know, it's like these themes like peace and security, development and human rights, national, regional and global actors must enhance cooperation through additional networking across the different thematic pillars, not to stay in their silos, but there has to be much more interaction. And this strengthens the peace and sustainability nexus as, nexus as well. And such networks can be open, flexible, and dynamic, allowing for variable participation by a wide, wide range of actors. What I mean is that it doesn't need to be like formal membership that has to be approved by the existing membership, and formally endorsing, but it could be much more open and flexible. And an example is an open, flexible multilateralism uh, is Alliance for Multilateralism. And this is an informal network of countries allowing for issue-based coalition. And it's an, there's an open invitation to every government and non-state actors like civil society, private sector. So it's, it's quite an open uh, form of multilateralism. Then the third one is more effective multilateralism is the one that delivers on its promises and all actors must be held accountable for commitments made and a balance is needed between what are the commitments that are considered as voluntary actions. Well, SDGs uh, is one of them because it's a, um, an, a resolution of the General Assembly, uh, which is a recommendation. And then the binding actions, such as the UN Security Council decision, depending on the challenges we face. And another one, which is actually implicit in the report, but not as clearly written, so I, I just put added by me, is more equitable, representative, and legitimate multilateralism. And it uh, touches on the other three as well, but the global situation should be reflected more, giving stronger presence and voice to the global South including developing countries, emerging economies. And then as developing countries gain more power and influence economically and otherwise, they should play a more active role in tackling global issues, basically taking more leadership. So at, at, at the same time, they must abide by international law and ensure justice, which is commitment number four of the UN 75 declaration. So this is an issue that still needs attention. So these are four points on multilateralism and let me move forward. Okay, so what after that report, our common agenda came out? Of course, it was discussed at the UN General Assembly uh, last um, year and a resolution was adopted on 15th of November last year. And the resolution um, and welcome the rich and substantive report by the Secretary General, and it called on the President of the UN General Assembly to initiate a process of follow-up to enable all member states to begin inclusive intergovernmental consideration of the proposals and the contents uh, included. And it called for collaboration with all relevant partners through broad and inclusive consultation. So ag again, the key word, broad consultation, inclusive consultation is repeated here. Then the UN uh, Secretary General said the report's recommendations aim to turbocharge the work on the SDGs. So again, the, the, the very uh, strong linkage with SDGs is also evident here. Okay, then let me now share my own observations and comments on in moving forward, considering the contents of the report and how to proceed. The first one is, yes, the report covers a broad range, 
and it contains many useful recommendations. So it should serve as a good launch pad for action and a pathway to a better world. Then second, it's good that there has been overall positive reaction by not only member states, but global leaders, think tanks and other organizations. And then many praised it as a landmark report, comprehensive, ambitious, but necessary, visionary and forward looking with long-term perspective and, you know, and innovative. Uh, some civil, civil society organizations wanted more in the UN reform part, such as the appointment of a civil society envoy. Uh, then third point is delivering on these ambitions may be the most challenging part, right? And considerable work is needed to translate the recommendations into concrete actions. And for that, ambitious transformative action is needed. So to do that, then uh, there's a need to examine, map out, and sequence the 90 recommendations based on the urgency as well as complexity and agree on a time frame for implementation. And I will talk about the five thematic consultations that will take place this month and next month in order to exactly do that. So moving forward, number fifth observation is the interlinkage that I already talked about, but I wanted to stress here, the interlinkage among the various recommendations must be given attention, uh, just like the interlinkage among the various SDGs that we need to always keep in mind. Then related to what I talked about, but it's, it's so important, so I listed it separately as number six, is implementation is most critical, right? And that's why the member states must immediately start the intergovernmental process to implement the recommendations, and that it has to be an inclusive multi-stakeholder process. And here the political commitment and leadership by member states are crucial. Uh, at the same time, the UN system and its agencies must immediately implement recommendations that they, they can be materialized within their authority because not every recommendation needs the endorsement of the member states. So UN agencies can go ahead and work on the part that they can on their own. And I mean, they may need the authority of the, their executive board, but you know, don't wait for intergovernmental consultation to take place first, okay? And at the same time, whatever that's being planned concrete time-bound commitments and outcomes must be agreed. So there has to be the beginning and the end. And for this, a major publicity campaign is needed. Our common agenda deserves attention and discussion. And I feel that it's not yet well known to many people and many organizations and many groups. So the last slide on this observation and comment is the eighth point is the proposed summit meetings. And I listed, I, I talked about three of them. They are important as they enable focused discussion on specific topics and forge global agreements. And they also provide a target year for deciding on specific, specific themes. As you know, there's a whole preparatory period leading to that specific date of the summit. And a lot of discussion uh, will take place during that long preparatory period. So now is not the time to complain and criticize what was not included as this report states, now is the time to take the next steps in our journey together in solidarity with and with all people. Our common agenda reinforces the need for robust action on the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. Again, the link here. And in order to move forward and to continue our implementation, we need periodic monitoring uh, on how we are progressing on implementation. So these are the observations, but then so what is next then? Okay, so what's next? As I mentioned, uh, the next step is starting this month is the consultation among the member states and others on the, our common agenda. And the, um, this was decided. Uh, so there will be intergovernmental discussion on five thematic clusters. And the five are listed there with the dates, um, just to mention, the titles, one is on accelerating and scaling up the SDGs, leaving no one behind. The second one is accelerating the SDGs through sustainable financing and building trust. Third one is frameworks for a peaceful world, promoting peace, international law and digital cooperation. Fourth one is protecting our planet and being prepared for the future. And the fifth one is enhancing international cooperation. 
So the objective of these um, consultations are to identify uh, initiatives that implementation could start before September 2022. September is when the General Assembly start. So first, uh, one is to focus on what are the immediate things that can start, but at the same time, it will also identify initiatives needing further consideration or maybe you know, further discussion. And the consultation will include a half day informal plenary debate and a day of panel discussions with UN system representatives and stakeholders, such as young people, civil society, private sector, and academics. So the point here is that it's not only intergovernmental limited to member states, but also other actors will be involved in this discussion. And for each of the five thematic clusters, concept notes are being prepared. So it would be interesting to see uh, what those notes will say. I'm really looking forward to seeing them. And in some areas of the, our common agenda, the UN Secretariat is already taking action, such as the Summit on Transforming Education, because it will have take place this year. So the Secretary General announced that this will happen and um, preparations are underway. So my last slide is that now is the time for action. We must move forward together in solidarity. Our common agenda is for us, for you, and for all people in the world. And thank you very much for listening. Now I'd like to invite our, uh, one of our members at NERVS at Hiroshima University. She uh, previously worked at the Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA, and Osaka Kyoiku University. And she has been uh, conducting research on the implementation of, of the SDGs. And her commentary today will definitely enrich our discussion about the SDGs. So researcher Tomomi Yamane, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yuge, uh, for insightful presentation of uh, our common agenda. Although I have been uh, doing research on the SDG, but I have not really been able to study uh, our common agenda. So it was very nice opportunity for me to learn. And but actually, when I first I saw, heard about our common agenda, I thought, oh my gosh, again, <laughs> another report or another like remarks or something. But like, as I, I like listened to your talk and listened uh, to heard about what's really said uh, in our common agenda, it's very um, important. And the first in the way that it's uh, the same as the formation or development of sustainable development goals this also did the like open consultation uh, with a range of uh, people and not only just did a small group of people but do the like large scale uh, survey to uh, understand what people really want uh, for us and so that was i think really important concept uh, and also the sdg is really agreed <laughs> before 2015. And I think in Japan, it's I think 2018 or 2019 was like really started. So we're kind of like really started doing it in like around like 2020. So it's already been quite old <laughs> when I actually start implementing. So as like you've mentioned about how some of the information is missing and indicator is not really clear enough and also, Although I think SDG included the importance of future generation and education in only in goal like four. And I think it's important that this, uh, our common agenda included the uh, future importance of future generation and involving them is a very important concept. And, and also, so I, I think uh, with a common agenda, uh, I'm hoping that the, we can accelerate uh, uh, SDG implementation and also you have mentioned about like how multilateralism is important and also challenges uh, toward the really uh, delivering our common agenda how we can uh, really uh, start uh, common agenda moving and and you've mentioned that our like transformative action is very important and you have uh, said uh, about how like maybe UN or a little uh, more structured consultation and also raising awareness of people is very important. And I think 
also like I'm doing research on on SDG and how to advance SDG and I think it's very important like as in like global agenda 2030 like SDG said like transforming our world like so we, we don't really not just like taking you know taking one goal or issue but like we really have to transform ourselves not just uh, maybe not just reducing uh, carbon dioxide and uh, carbon dioxide emission global uh, greenhouse gas emissions or uh, just to deal with human rights issue but like we everybody I think has to transform our lifestyle or thinking and that's I think very important concept and I so you have mentioned uh, quite clearly on how uh, what's the challenge and we we should be doing, but I I wonder uh, through your like long U, UN experience and and maybe with your maybe your experience maybe you could share a little bit more detail on what can be most difficult challenges to implement our common agenda and what can we do, you know I I think it's important to although the like meeting and the consultation and all the system is important but I'm sure you work. <laughs> and the back behind the scenes, so I'm sure you know more about it. So hopefully you can share those kind of things. Thank you. Thank you very much. So shall I respond or uh, yeah, is, is that okay? Right, yeah. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yamane, for those uh, very useful uh, comments. Um, I listen with a great interest to your comments and then uh, I was, uh, um, um, I, I so thought the first comment, again, another report could be an, a reaction by some people, but then I hope uh, after reading the report, uh, many people don't think so. And the other important point is, as you mentioned, the connection between the SDGs. So it is really something that, that uh, reinforces the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. So it's not, I hope people will not see it as, here's the 2030 agenda SDGs and here's the common agenda, but actually that the two things are very much uh, overlapping you know, in a good way. They, they are really intersecting and then reinforcing the many issues that are important, continue to be important and, and also adding some new issues and, and some attention. So regarding the, the question, yes, I mean, the implementation is most important now, now that the report came out. And what can be uh, some of the more difficult challenges? Uh, yeah, that's actually something that we all have to face now. How to deal with the challenges and how to surmount them and how to still move forward. So one of the, the challenges that I feel it's um, one of the most difficult is, is the level of commitment of the member states, of the governments. So basically what I'm talking about is governments that are not committed, not interested in either the 2030 agenda SDGs or uh, the contents of our common agenda. And how to deal with this is um, depends on that particular government. So, you know, what are they against or they're just not interested? I think actions can be taken at the local level, uh, meaning the national level and also lower level, the communities, local governments, and at the global uh, international community level. When it comes to the national level, for instance, because I was based in developing countries, namely Thailand, Indonesia, Bhutan as a representative representing the, the UN, uh, one UN agency, UNDP, at the local level, it's important to continue the dialogue, basically to discuss with the host country government to first uh, for them to understand that this is not just a global agenda, but then the relevance, because there must be some parts at least, well, some parts or many parts of our common agenda that is relevant to that particular you know, host government. And then to talk about the relevance of those parts to that government and then how the situation can be tackled and basically find some entry points. And it can be education, it can be health, it could be one or few areas where cooperation can start in real terms and then gradually expand. It's not realistic to deal with a whole package of the issues in our common agenda because then it seems too daunting. And so that's not the right way. So that's at the national level. And I always saw myself as a UNDP staff member based in a developing country as a supporter you know, of that government. You know, I, I'm there to support from the UN side. I saw myself as a facilitator, if it's possible, you know, as an accelerator, you know, as a catalyst to bring 
uh, information about the experiences of other developing countries or bring other UN agencies and, and, and also act as also as an advocate, I advocate for the important global standards, global goals, and then attention caller. So I call attention that perhaps your government may wish to focus on these areas that are included in the SDGs or common agenda, but of course, leaving the decision up to that government. So that is at the uh, local level, I mean, what I really experienced. The other one is at the international community level. I think uh, the international community's pressure can act to well, pressure some governments to move forward. I saw that happening in the climate change area, although more is needed, but also with the uh, MDGs and SDGs. I think the international pressure, because uh, countries are now expected to produce their national reports. And in the case of SDGs, they have to submit the voluntary national reports to the UN, the high level politi political forum. And then that's a place where there would be kind of peer review and thinking and exchanging information. So there is pressure to do something about it, to take action. Okay, there hasn't been any decision yet to present the national or common agenda yet, but then international pressure is, is always something that should work positively as well. And then the last point on that is the power of the local governments, communities and individuals cannot be underestimated. Whatever happens, even when central governments are not as enthusiastic or, or not as interested, local governments and local communities can take action. I mean, you know, the, the case with the President Trump and the climate change. He walked out of the Paris Agreement, but then many states in the US, they were very enthusiastic and they took action. So, so uh, I mean, that is one major challenge, how to get the governments that are not interested to, to move forward. And then just one last point is one is, another one is finance. You know, there's always a need for finance and there's always not enough to do everything that's needed. And uh, for this, everybody has to chip in, especially the developed countries that can do that. But then I would look more for the private sector to do more. The private sector, uh, they should be involved much more, not just in financing, in funds, but also technology, in-kind you know, equipment. They should get more involved in dealing with the SDGs, uh, contributing to it, participating, and the same thing with our common agenda. And they have the ability to do that. So uh, of course, if I keep on talking, I will talk for 15 minutes more and finish the seminar. So I will stop now on this particular question. Thank you very much for the good, good question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yugen. Thank you, Yamane san Yeah, I wish we could hear more about it, but yeah, we have to give way for some of the questions that we have been receiving. Thank you to everybody who already posted their questions. And I just want to uh, raise this question that we received earlier, Professor Yuge. And this is from Nasratula Ilam. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, but uh, from the Ministry of Agriculture of Afghanistan. And his question is probably a little bit related to uh, Yamanisan's question too, is that how can the UN strengthen the relationship and harmony among all UN members in order to implement this common agenda? Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah, right. So in a way, a part of my uh, reply to um, Yapanesan covered that, but I, I just like to stress the fact that um, basically uh, continue the consultation among member countries, you know, when you talk about the strengthening the relationship and harmony, and it's good that in, in uh, February and March, we have these more specific consultations to talk about the issues. Um, global consultation is one form, but if it works, regional level consultation is fine or sub-regional level of consultation. For instance, Africa has different forums to talk about you know, some issues and then in Asia or Latin America. So uh, it can be um, you know, also uh, several countries, it could be like ASEAN, but then basically to uh, talk, keep on talking about this exchanging information and experience of how some of the countries that are more advanced in dealing with some of the issues or they are tackling the issues, how are they doing it? Can they be um, good reference? I mean, learn learned lessons, lessons learned from such experience, or it could be you know, a good way for other countries to learn from that. So I think this consultation is very, very important. The other point that is very important is the role of the UN, because I think part of your question was, uh, you know, how the UN uh, can strengthen and, and this harmony. So the good um, part of the UN, and it's a, it's a comparative advantage, which is unique to the UN, is that UN is a convener. 
you know, UN is a convener of global actors like member states, but also the other non-state actors when it holds like summit meetings. And at the same time, it can be also taking a lead in regional consultations uh, besides um, a member state in, in that region. So, so this convener role is very, very important because it gives a forum for you know, gathering. Um, it could be at the head of a state level in summit meetings, or it could be at the ministerial level. But then um, it's a strong um, comparative advantage that the UN has. And then also at the same time, some of the other comparative advantage like uh, setting a global agenda, like it did, setting global goals. Some of these additional meetings can lead to more specific goals, some um, milestones and indicators for some of the, the recommendations of our common agenda. And also uh, it can be a very uh, new, good neutral body to monitor the implementation. Actually, that was one of my, the, the 11th item. And the UN has an advantage. And then with that, it can strengthen you know, the, the peer review as well as information sharing. And that can strengthen the uh, harmony and relationship among the different uh, UN members, but also in addition to that, as I mentioned, other stakeholders. So, so UN has a very, very important role to play. Uh, and it should use its comparative advantages to the maximum in order to fulfill this role. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yuge. And thank you also for reminding us earlier of the value of uh, focusing or prioritizing a specific issue. And I think in this time, because of the ongoing pandemic, health issue is one of these issues. And this is related to a question that we have received through the Q&A uh, box. So for everyone else, if you have questions either in the chat box or in the Q&A box. So the question is, um, uh, the WHO declared that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So how, how, what, what is your understanding of healthcare? Is it a short-term or a long-term understanding? Okay, um, I, I agree with the, what WHO is saying. I mean, when we talk about health, it's not just the physical health, which is of course most important, but then it def definitely it, would, it should include the other aspects uh, in terms of mental health, that is so important. I mean, mental health can affect the physical health of the person. And then, you know, in terms of the social side, that is very important in terms of how, how a person can um, behave to the maximum in terms of using the, that, that person's physical ability, a mental ability, in order to be able to participate fully in the society. And then it just doesn't mean uh, to be healthy. You know, to be healthy and being able to active includes being mentally healthy, mentally active, as well as also, you know, socially being able to move around and do the things. So, um, so healthcare is is definitely long term. Of course, at each moment there are things to focus. Like infants need to, you know, be given a certain type of attention, and then during teenagers and so on, there are different ones. But definitely. Um, so, so short-term attention is also needed for that particular age group or particular condition of the person, but uh, it should be a long-term from from um, the cradle to the graveyard. You know, as people say, from the time you're born to the time you die. You know, that's what health matters. The, the whole the whole lifelong period. I completely agree with you too, Professor Yuge. Uh, we have a question from Naoko Takasu from Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University. And uh, I just want to read here that uh, uh, the comment. I was glad to see that the Secretary General and yourself pointed out the issue of current economic system focusing on GDP, which doesn't prioritize well-being of people and the planet. Would you kindly let us know if the resolution adopted on 15th of November contains concrete actions in this regard and which consultation among five consultations you mentioned will deal with this issue? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So, so yeah, thank you very much, Takasang. I'm glad that you pointed out on, on this issue because this is a very important issue. And it, just to, to uh, look at the five thematic areas, I mean, which one does it fit also depends on um, how the concept notes will be prepared, you know, because they are being prepared. In a way, 
you know, it's an issue that um, I think I think it may be included in that broad area that raises, although the issue itself, I feel it's not an issue that can be confined to one uh, broad area, because when you talk when we talk about GDP, then it's, you know, the economy, uh, the care system, social factors. So it is actually mentioned under broad area one. So um, this is how it um, uh, was uh, included. In terms of the resolution, resolution on the 15th of November, I mean, it doesn't go into details because it cannot go into the 90 recommendations. So basically, if you read that recommendation, I mean, it would be a more all encompassing uh, recommendation and resolution in terms of moving forward, right? So I think the details will come out and we do need the expertise of you know, economists and, and uh, sociologists and, and other uh, partners to come up with this. I mean, this has been not a new issue, but it's an old issue. You know, many people criticize that GDP is being used to measure the country's wealth. It, I would say it's a one way. And of course, I mean, long, long time ago when UNDP started to publish the Human Development Report, which is still being published, I mean, that was one of the arguments. But then I think there hasn't been a focused attention for the world to see then what is the way to look at some of the other elements that are missing from the GDP. I mean, of course, we can look at different indicators and then compare, but I think we need a more systematic way to look at uh, this issue, and especially as we focus on the environment and the climate change, there has to be a much more active way and a more um, explicit way to, to deal with this. So um, again, I, I don't know which of the five thematic uh, themes it would uh, come out to because it relates to uh, many of them. And um, I would say it, it relates to all of them. It may be protecting our planet and being prepared for the future. But then again, it could be also, I mean, it's also related to um, this framework for a peaceful world and so on. So let, let's see that that is, I mean, the, the important thing is that it is discussed thoroughly and it doesn't really matter to me which thematic uh, consultation of the five it will be taken up. It has to be taken up and it has to be followed so that some kind of a clear conclusion will come out. And moreover, that countries will adopt that if it's just a resolution to say, this is how we do it, but then if the countries don't use it, if it's not embedded in the statistical, um, you know, kind of research or statistical collection, you know, or, or, or the methodology of how to deal with it so that it really makes sense in terms of being able to see, you know, how they, uh, they feature. So, so that's actually the bottom line that I see. And I do hope that, um, it does take place that way. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I expect that you will also be watching the progress. So maybe we can have another conversation after the thematic consultation to see if it came out um, explicitly or if it's not enough. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, very good uh, question. Thank you, Professor Yuge, for that comprehensive answer. I think it just goes to show how interconnected these issues are and how interconnected the solutions or recommendations to these issues. And we have a question about multilateralism here. Um, if you could uh, um, explain to us a little bit how multilateralism um, work in terms of balancing international politics vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the protection of uh, dignity uh, in order to advance human security. So, um, because you have uh, uh, clearly explained to us how, what kind of multilateralism would work in order to achieve our common agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. right. So, so uh, yeah, multilateralism, of course, there's so many different forms and um, it can take um, uh, different um, uh, dynamics in order to reach uh, global uh, decisions, right? So in terms of uh, promoting human security, as you mentioned, um, and the protection of the dignity, uh, which deals with the uh, human rights you know, issues, uh, it's very much embedded in many development issues. So when we talk about um, uh, some of the summits and discussion um, on the themes of the summits, it would inevitably uh, cover protection of dignity, you know, human dignity, and also promotion of human security. Um, I think the difficult part of the multilateralism 
uh, where we struggle, we have been struggling most is, is um, the political element. I mean, you did mention in that question about the, the international politics. If it gets to politics in terms of uh, sovereignty, you know, power dynamics, who is going to influence who at the expense of which country, that's the part that gets into a quite a difficult period and competitiveness you know, among the countries. So um, I feel that when it comes to the development area, hopefully that will be a little bit less than if we are talking about straightforward, you know, political area uh, that is like more and more, you know, politics. Of course, there's, there's always an element of development. And so um, it should work um, uh, if, if the countries are committed. Of course, we don't want the disruptors. I mean, they're always disruptors, but then with most people, and especially the strong countries, and this could be the problem, <laughs> the strong countries agreeing and positively uh, dealing with issues in order to move forward. And uh, I think the other thing that's important is uh, the global decision and the national decision um, distinction. Of course, like the SDGs, uh, I'm sure the common uh, agenda, um, finally in these summits, may come up with uh, global aspirations. And it has to be global aspirations because it cannot be too low and easily achievable. So like the SDGs, many people thought that it's not achievable, but then it's ambitious global aspirations, which I think are needed for a global agreement, right? And then at the same time, the good thing about SDGs is that the national goals uh, were left to each country, but bearing in mind the global aspiration and the global goals. But then that's why the even the reports are voluntary national reports. You know, this is after the discussion with the member states. They didn't want to be bound by the global goals to say everybody has to agree. agree. So as I see multilateralism, there has to be this kind of a flexibility. The global goals has to be set. You know, and then it's I know it's an aspiration. It could be realistic to some member governments. Definitely, it won't be realistic to all governments considering the different stages of development, but the, those governments should keep that aspiration and the goals in mind in order to reach that. But then perhaps they say at this point, because it's just right after a conflict or they are very difficult situation that our national goals are at this level, but we would strive. And I hope those national aspirations and that national goals will be as ambitious as possible and not something that can easily be achieved to say we achieve the national goals. So, so this is how I see the multilateralism. I mean, it's a very complex uh, issue. And again, I can keep on talking for another hour. It's a very good question, thank you. But I will confine myself because of the time constraint. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Yuge. And thank you to everybody who uh, posed their questions. Thank you, Professor Yuge, for successfully fielding all these very important questions. And I'm so sorry to um, the rest who were, uh, were not able to answer your questions live, but we'll make sure that uh, we'll keep the questions and pass it on to Professor Yuge for her consideration. Uh, I'm sorry that we run out of time now, but uh, I just want to thank you all again for this very active uh, participation in this webinar. Thank you very much, Professor Yuge, for your time today. And um, personally, what I learned is really the importance of what you said, inclusive network, more effective, and in your words, more equitable, more representative and more legitimate uh, multilateralism. And I really encourage everyone to, uh, as I feel encouraged, to be catalysts and advocates and attention callers for the many issues that we face these days. Thank you very much, Professor Yuge. And to everybody, we hope to continue this conversation at our upcoming NERPS conference, the very first Hiroshima International Conference on Peace and Sustainability from March 1 to 3 this year, next month. And the registration for non-presenting uh, non participants is still open until February 2022. And you can visit our website, www.nerps.org um, for more details. And you can also follow our updates through our social media accounts and our monthly newsletter. Um, thank you again, Professor Yuge, for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Dalia, Dr. Yamane, and also uh, Professor Kaneko for the wonderful opportunity. And also to all the participants, I enjoy your questions and, and comments also. Um, 
uh, Dr. Yamane, and then I, I you know, loved interacting. So uh, please think about the, our common agenda. Let's move forward, take action. You know? yes. And then I hope to see you again. Thank you so much. And thank you, of course, to NURPS and Hiroshima University for this wonderful occasion for me to have a dialogue with all of you. Thank you. Thank you.